Welcome to the Turkey Hunter Podcast with me, your host, Andy Galliano. In this podcast, I share with turkey hunters just like you how to have more turkeys on your hunting property and how to have more successful turkey hunts. I teach you how to do this with tips and interviews with turkey hunting pros, wildlife management tips, and entertaining turkey hunting stories. Tune in weekly as I share proven and simple strategies to help you have more success this turkey season. Make sure to head over to www.iamturkeyhunting.com to subscribe to receive free turkey hunting tips, tactics, strategies, and product reviews. Also, please visit and like my Facebook fan page. Go to Facebook and search I Am Turkey Hunting. And also feel free to post your turkey hunting photos from this past season and let us know where and when you killed your bird. For all of you Twitter users out there, please follow me on Twitter where my handle is at Turkey Hitman, and I will be sure to follow you back. And now, for this week's show. Hello, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Turkey Hunter Podcast. You are listening to episode number 135, Handling the Disappointment of Turkey Hunting, with Robert Kroger. And I am your host, and the guy who has a much shorter to-do list at home. So due to lovely weather over the weekend and my lovely bride being out of town for the weekend, I was able to get quite a few things marked off of my to-do list around the house. Things are looking better out in the yard and I can see a fishing rod in my hand in the future. That is a good thing. So today we are 294 days Nine hours, five minutes, and 40 seconds away from opening day of spring turkey season in Alabama. We're now less than 300 days away. I'm telling you, it's going to be here before you know it. Don't blink. So we've got a really good show for you guys today, but before we get into the interview, I want to cover a little bit of turkey news for you. So, some of the end of season results are coming in. And when I say results, I'm talking about the harvest results. And it turns out that there are a few states that had harvest numbers above last year's numbers. Indiana is one of those. So there were more than 13,000 turkeys harvested in Indiana during the 2017 season. And that's about a 7% increase over 2016. And it makes 2017 the third highest spring turkey harvest on record. The Indiana Department of Natural Resources said that even though there were large amounts of rainfall and flooding throughout the season, the weather did not appear to be a limiting factor. That is very exciting news for Indiana turkey hunters and and Indiana's neighbors to the west, Illinois, also had a slightly better turkey harvest this year compared to last year, where hunters killed 15,719 turkeys this spring compared to 15,484 in 2016. Now, a lot of officials in Illinois are saying that the reason that that number is greater is because there is a greater harvest during the youth turkey season this year that the weather was better on the youth weekend than it was last year. Whatever the reason is, there were more turkeys taken, and that's a good thing. And one more piece of harvest info for you guys is West Virginia. Spring turkey hunters harvested 11,539 gobblers in West Virginia this year, and that's an 11% increase over 2016. It's also the largest harvest number since 2006 when there were 11,735 birds harvested. This year's harvest in West Virginia is more than 18% above the 10-year average. And the top five counties for harvest were Preston, Mason, Jackson, Wood, and Harrison counties. So that is all good news for hunters in those states. 
and I'm going to transition today from talking about good turkey hunting news to turkey hunting news that we can sometimes make to be bad turkey hunting news. Today's interview is definitely something different. You know, many of us die-hard turkey hunters spend a lot of time, energy, and money in preparing for turkey season. There's money spent on gasoline, groceries, licenses and tags, clothing, guns, bug spray, a lot of bug spray, shotgun shells, hunting club dues, planting and maintaining food plots, just to name a few of those items that we spend money on to chase turkeys. And some of us die-hard hunters spend even more time, energy, and money in preparing to take trips to hunt turkeys in other states or even in other countries. Rental cars, outfitters, airfare, tips, hotels, and all the other things mentioned. Many times when we spend a great amount of time and money planning our turkey hunts and our turkey hunting trips, We have expectations of how our hunting season or even our hunting trips will turn out. We all want and too often we all expect our trips to end with taking pictures of ourselves with our trophy tom slung over our back or a log with a fan all spread out. But the reality is that these hunts don't always work out this way. Sometimes the season or these trips we take don't end the way we expect for any number of reasons. Sometimes the season ends or we arrive home from these trips only to fill our freezer with tag soup instead of wild turkey meat. Well, today I want to introduce you to Robbie Kroger. Robbie is a turkey hunter from Mississippi who has figured out a way to prepare tag soup so that it is not so bitter and can actually be enjoyable. So here's Robbie to share his story and his recipe for tag soup. Enjoy the interview, and I will see you guys on the other side. Hey guys, I am glad to tell you that I have on the line with me tonight Robbie Kroger from Mississippi. Robbie is a listener of the show, and he and I have communicated on Twitter quite a bit over, really, I guess, over the course of this hunting season. He's included me in quite a few pictures from his hunts, and I always enjoy that. So it gives me a chance to get to know you guys a little bit better. But Robbie's got a little bit of an artistic flair to his photography as well, and and I I like what he does. So, you know, he kind of leaves you hanging a little bit with his tweets about, There'll be some pictures of a feather or some feathers on the ground or, you know, maybe attached to a bird. And there'll be a a semi-vague statement or quote to go along with it and lead you to guess a little bit as to what's going on. So I got one of these tweets. And let me see if I can find this tweet real quick and read it to you guys. But it is the source of our conversation tonight. So... On the 18th of April, I get tagged in a tweet that has a passport picture and a picture of a ticket for the airline. And the destination is Mexico City. Well, that's pretty exciting there because the tweet itself says world slam leg and then hashtag oscillated hashtag NWTF. So that was the 18th of April. On the 26th of April, I'm tagged in another tweet, and it's a picture of a turkey tag that has not been validated. And it says, the end result, hashtag tag soup, a contrasted tale of elation, wonder, and awe versus gutted disappointment, humility, self-reflection, and growth. Well, that tweet right there caused me to reach out to Robbie, and I had to get more of the story. I had to learn more about what happened. So we exchanged several direct messages on Twitter, and finally we got to speak. And I can't remember if that was on my way back from North Carolina or after I was back from North Carolina, but I disappeared on you for about three or four days there while we were in the mountains chasing turkeys and had no cell service. But after you and I spoke, 
and I heard your story about your trip and you offered to come on the show to talk about this. And I thought, you know, it's a great topic, especially now that we're at the end of turkey season for the majority of the world. And your situation is not an uncommon one. So in just a second, I'm going to dig in with Robbie. We're going to get to the story of what happened on this trip to the Yucatan. And in the meantime, Robbie, how are you and where are you? I am better than I deserve, Andy, and I'm sitting on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi right now. And you can clearly tell that I'm a native Mississippian. (laughs) Well, with your accent, I wasn't going to guess that you were in lower Mississippi. I was actually going to go with lower Alabama. Uh, A little further south. A little further south and a little bit further east or west, just depending on which direction you want to go to get there, huh? That's right. Yeah, originally from South Africa, uh, you know, raised up there and uh, came over to the States in 2003. Fantastic. Fantastic. That is a beautiful place. And if anybody listening has never been, I highly recommend you go. Even if you do not hunt, it is an amazing place to visit. And There's stay only for one a thing while. wrong with it, Andy. There's only one thing wrong with it. There's no turkeys in Africa. There are no turkeys in Africa. You're right about that. Oh, shoot. What's the name <laughs> of the bird there, the, the larger ground bird? Uh, the Cory busted. There you go. There you go. Yeah, I think they're callable. Don't you think they might be callable? It's a big bird. Yeah, they are definitely. So we need to come up with a call for them and see if we can call them in during their mating season and go down there and hunt them. That'd be fun. I appreciate you joining us. I know from our conversation that having arrived in the U.S. in 2003, you are relatively new to turkey hunting, but we've got people who are listening to the show who are more new to turkey hunting than you. But I was wondering if you were interested in doing the rapid fire Q&A. I am indeed. Let's do it. All right. I like that. So you know the drill. You listen to the show. I'm going to pull the stopwatch up here on my phone and I will press start as soon as I start the first question and we will rock and roll with this. 10 four. How many turkeys did you kill last season? Six. Diaphragm, box, pot and peg, push, pull, tuber, wing bone. Slate. Wild turkey, grilled, baked, or fried? Grilled. Wild turkey on the rocks, neat with cola or with water? Definitely coke. Have you ever killed a bearded hen? Never. Have you ever killed a jake? Yes, I have. A 10-minute successful hunt on a 2-year-old or a 4-hour long hunt with a clean miss on a 4-year-old? Hmm, number two, four hour. All right. Wild turkey legs for dinner or for the dog? Definitely for dinner. More or less than five strikers in your turkey vest? Less. The state you killed your first turkey in? Florida. The state you killed your last turkey in? Texas. Should have been the Yucatan. (laughs) Sit in a blind for four hours and squeeze the trigger or run and gun for one hour and not shoot? Run and gun and not shoot. Two and three quarter inch, three inch, or three and a half inch shells. The bigger the better. Four, five, six, or blended shot. Blended. Fields turkeys or woods turkeys? Woods turkeys. Pump or automatic? Pump. Shotgun scope, rifle sight, holographic sight, or beads? Beads. Rubber boots, leather boots, or snake boots? Rubber boots. The most turkeys you've ever killed in a season? Six. The least number of turkeys you've ever killed in a season? Zero. Out of all the states you've hunted, which has the most uncooperative turkeys? Mississippi. If you only knew how to imitate one turkey sound to call turkeys, what would it be? A yelp. On a scale of one to ten, how good of a turkey caller do you think you are? A minus two. (laughs) The best turkey hunter you know? The turkey whisperer, Steve Brown. All right. Favorite turkey hunting book? Oh, there's only one, right? The Tenth Legion. Who taught you how to turkey hunt? The turkey whisperer, Steve Brown. Think of the toughest turkey that you've ever hunted. Did you ever kill him? No. (laughs) Do you prefer long, sharp spurs or long, thick beards? Long, thick beards. The biggest mistake new turkey hunters make? Missing. The bigger fear during turkey season, snakes or spiders? Say that again, you broke up on me. Biggest fear during turkey season, snakes or spiders? I break up again. I uh, not don't have any fears actually. Oh, oh, I stumped him on yeah. that one. So it was a, a no answer. How long does turkey season last in heaven, and what is the bag limit? 
Six weeks, three turkeys. <laughs> I like it. Four minutes and 9.97 seconds. Now, you made me laugh a couple of times in there, so that got dragged out a little bit, but that's that's pretty good for a foreigner. <laughs> Not bad for a foreigner. <laughs> so you hold the record for the fastest time by a foreigner on the Rapid Fire q and I hold the record? Yeah, you hold the record for the fastest time by a foreigner. Uh, or maybe I'm the only foreigner you've ever interviewed. Well, I mean, now you're getting technical on me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So talk to me a little bit. Tell me your story about how you got into turkey hunting. You mentioned that your buddy, the turkey whisperer, got you into turkey hunting. But give a little bit more detail of that. Yeah. And, and Andy, I appreciate you uh, inviting me on the podcast. You know, your your podcast is, is one of the only ones available to us addicted souls that do chase these these feathered fiends around the country. And, you know, my story is a little different than everybody else. As you as you've already mentioned, I arrived in the States in 2003. I come from a, a hunting background. You know, my family were all big hunters. My grandfather emigrated from Germany to South Africa back in the 50s, lived the heyday of African hunting. Uh, but hunting was essentially in his blood. It was, you know, he was a he was the epitome of a hunter gatherer in the Siberian taiga. He literally had to hunt for the pot to feed his family, and that's what they were his, they lived on, really. And so, when he moved to Africa, he had all the experiences. My father was raised in that environment, was given a Cape buffalo at his 16th birthday present, and so you can imagine me as a teenage boy, you know, being raised in in South Africa at the time with all these hunting stories around me and all these trophies around me and, and interacting with my grandfather and the father, yet I didn't have the opportunity to go hunting. You know, hunting in, you know, unbeknownst to a lot of folks, there's more wildlife running around here in America than there is in, in Africa. Everything there is behind a fence. And, you know, it, even though the, the expanses behind those fences are enormous, yeah. it's not geared to a blue-collared South African to go hunting. There's no hunting licenses. There's no hunting seasons. There's, there's nothing. And so when I arrived in this country... You know, that, that, that core desire to hunt was, is buried in me, right? It's buried in my blood somewhere. And it just got reignited by just being in the culture that is the South, that is hunting. You know, I was, I spent pretty much the, since 2003 in Mississippi and just dabbled a little bit in hunting, never got into it very seriously. You know, one of the things I mentioned to you, Andy, was there was this moment that I wrote the story and I titled the story Like Versus Love. Mm -hmm. And it was a moment in time. And it wasn't a turkey hunt, unfortunately. It would have been it would have made the, the podcast that much better. Right. But <laughs> it was a one of those terrible, terrible, just awful weather duck hunts that you are just like, are you seriously considering going out in this weather? Because no, no, you know, no self-respecting duck is going to be flying in this weather. <laughs> <laughs> and up until that point, I had considered myself a hunter, but really I was just a, a like to hunter, i.e. I like to hunt when the weather was nice and when it was comfortable and when I could drive out to the blind and, you know, sit down and here come the ducks and we can shoot a couple of ducks. And, and the same thing with deer hunting and the same thing with turkey hunting. The turkey hunting then was, I have just one side anecdote there that I think I purchased some sort of mouth call at, you know, the local Walmart or something like that. And I went with some buddies in Oxford, Mississippi that, that turkey hunted. And I got out the vehicle and I thought I'd done, I'd been practicing my turkey calling. Yeah. And I slapped the mouth call in my mouth and I said, Hey, hey guys, listen to this. I've been, I've been practicing a lot. And this is where the whole minus two turkey calling comes into effect. And I did whatever it was, because I don't think I even knew what a Yelp was at that point in time. <laughs> and uh, you can imagine the reaction. They were like, put that back in the car and leave it where it is. <laughs> um, but that, that, that duck hunt did something to me. That duck hunt, we went out in that weather. It was the most amazing hunt I've ever experienced. But there was just something about the occasion. There was something about me sitting in that cold water, seeing what was happening around me that just caused something to be ignited within me. Like I really turned the corner and that's why I called like versus love because then I became a love to hunter. I love to hunt. And so that just sort of blossomed into all facets of hunting, especially turkey hunting. And so at the time, I'd, I'd known Steve in, in Starkville, Mississippi. At the time, I'd already moved to Mississippi State, where I was a professor in the Wildlife, Fisheries, and Aquaculture Department. And so we just started talking, and he just started encouraging me to, you know, learn a little bit more, apply here, apply there. And we got to a point where 
I said, well, I, I really want to take this seriously. And this was literally three years ago. So let's start really applying in different states and, and let's let's try and do this. And at this time, I hadn't killed a turkey. Yeah. Right. I'd been several times. I'd, and, and look, the guys that are listening to this podcast are going to go, you know, they, these guys listen to this podcast that spend the entire season of their respective home states in the woods. And then they go to the next state that's in season. Then they go to the next state. You know, somebody texted me today. Hey, heading to Nebraska. It's still open. Yeah. I'm like, you're a crazy hunting fool. Yeah. You know? And so we started applying and I applied for a public land tag in Florida for, he said, you know, there's some places you can apply for. So apply. Steve runs an outfitting business. And so he had already arranged a, an, a, a, a hunt in Mexico for the Goulds. And if you know anything about Florida public land hunting, your tag gets drawn really early. So you know that you're going to go down pretty early in the season. And I drew it. And this was last year. So I drew the tag. And lo and behold, and people are going to be like, I can't believe that he drew a public land Osceola hunt. He's never killed a turkey before. And yeah, that's what was my first turkey it was an Osceola, public land Osceola. Yeah. And when I when I drew the tag, I, I was talking to Steve and I was talking to another friend of mine at um, Wardlaw in Starkville. And they said, if you can kill both those turkeys, those are the most geographically impossible turkeys to kill. Why not try and kill all the others in North America? And so yeah. there's this this thing got this thing got born, right? <laughs> this idea like, hey, you're going to kill your first turkey when you're you know, 36, 37 years old, which is, again, unheard of for somebody in the States because you kill your first turkey when you're 11 or 12 with your dad. And I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. They said, well, why don't you just try and do the Royal Slam in one year in the, in the same year you killed your first turkey? Yeah. What a story. Yeah. And so we did it. <laughs> yeah. It was it was work. It was, you know, at times as you as we all know, frustrating, but just exceptional landscapes, exceptional environments, walking, you know, going from the swamps of, of Florida to the mesquite thorn thickets of Texas where you're paying a blood tax to whatever God is living in Texas to get those turkeys yes. to the mountains of New Mexico, you know, and then into the Sonoran Mountains in, 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 in Mexico itself. Mm -hmm. Just incredible landscapes where all these different birds live. And I got to experience it in one season. Yeah. And it was exceptional. It was exceptional. Yeah, that's awesome. So you killed your first turkey and completed a royal slam in the same season. That's correct. And a lot of people, and if there's some of my friends that will be listening to this will say that I had no business killing my Royal Slam in the first year that I killed my first turkey because, and, and this, you know, part of the reason you've got me on here is that I'm a young turkey hunter. You know, I'm a young hunter in my, in, in its entirety. Right. And so I've got a lot to learn still. And I've got a lot to learn in terms of calling and woodsmanship and, and just all the pieces that go to, to making yourself a better hunter. And so that season was an abnormal season in that, I had a couple of misses, but it wasn't, you know, was a miss. And then, I, you know, we got the turkey, as most ha sometimes happens in the in the woods. But it was a fairly extraordinary season for for any turkey hunter for to do that in one in one season, especially one that had a little help on the way. Of course, you know, I wasn't doing this by myself. So right, yeah, and that's key, you know. And I think so many new hunters are out there doing it themselves, and it's really difficult. And then difficult to do. To even turkey hunt in their own state, their home state, and then the thought of, okay, I'm going to go to Texas or Oklahoma and try to kill a Rio. I'm going to go to Florida and try to kill an Osceola. You know, I'm going to go to these different states and, and do all of this, and they're doing it all on their own. And, you know, I would still do it, and I've, and I've done it on my own. I, I went to Texas and killed my first Rio by myself, but... It's more fun when you have a group of people there, not just who can help you, but just to share the experience with. And so, you know, those those men and women who get out there and do it, do all this on their own, I admire them. You know, it takes takes a lot of drive. It's it's hard some mornings to get up out of bed, even when you're at the house and go turkey hunting when you're going by yourself. But if you have a hunting buddy going with you, I know personally I jump up and throw my clothes on and run out of the door. There is no sleepy eyed grogginess to waking up on those mornings so 
Yeah. There's something to be said to 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 both aspects, right? There's this inherent bond, and you, and yeah. that's why you are doing your super slam with buddies, right? You're not doing it by yourself because there's an, this inherent bond that you forge with your hunting friends and your partners, so that in that moment of elation, that moment of wonder and awe, that moment of gutted disappointment, there's somebody there to share it with, right? It's not just you by yourself, but counter to that there is a a sense of being when you are by yourself that this is all you and you're in this moment and you know you do that essentially to fulfill something inside of you and that's why people do it on on a solo basis so there's merits to both i'm personally not going to do many hunts by myself just because i want to experience that i want to experience that with a friend with somebody yeah. who's who's kindred like me that is also that can that i can you know we can point back to you know 10 years down the line oh man you remember that hunt you remember that time right. we we got stuck in that canyon and you know froze ourselves to death yeah it's just somebody that you can point to yeah that's exactly right so tell me then about your trip to mexico how did this come about and how long did it take you to get this put together? Yeah, so we finished the Royal Slam last year and Steve had been talking about going down to the Yucatan. Steve is somebody who is who's done that he's been there done that a lot you know, a lot. He's he's killed multiple oscillated turkeys. He said that he's not going to go back to the jungle for many more times. He's going to go back next year. Would I be interested? And so through his outfitting business, we organized with a, a hunting company down there, great outfitter, uh, Baja Outfitters, and we just sort of put all the pieces together at the beginning of this turkey season. So January, February, March, we just started talking about it, and he said, you want to go do this? And again, what a wonderful story. Let's Yeah, let's go down to the jungle. Let's experience something completely out of the ordinary, especially given the fact that the hunt is completely different than what you're used to, typically in Mississippi or anywhere really in the country. And you know, let's, let's get out of the comfort zone a little bit and let's see if we can finish this thing strong and have a great story to tell because of it. Now, little did I know that the story was going to take a 180 degree bend, but in all honesty, I think it turned in the, in the right direction. Yeah. I was even talking to my wife before I left and I was saying to her, I had drawn, I've drawn another tag for a big western hunt next year and i was talking to her about how i needed to and it's just it's it's fortuitous timing you can you can almost think of it as as the sort of lord's fingerprints on everything but mm -hmm. i said to her i said i'm going to have to learn and these are my exact words i'm going to have to learn to be okay not harvesting that animal i'm going to have to be okay essentially eating a tag sandwich or going having tag soup like everybody says yeah. and i was talking about that western hunt i wasn't even talking about the hunt that i was literally days away from going on so to me in my brain and the way i approached that hunt it was a slam dunk and that was my first mistake right so we arrived in the jungle an amazing amazing place you know full of animals that you just you just think about ocelots, you know, javelinas, Mexican quail everywhere, howler monkeys going through uh, the trees. We got uh, we got into camp at the just perfect time from a from a dominance perspective of the of the male turkeys. The way that they were just they were, it was they were singing in the trees. You could locate them, you could catch them on the roost, shoot them off the roost. You could actually not not threaten them but you were you were playing calls to them you were literally yeah. playing their vocalization and getting them to be more territorial because they're very territorial challenge so they would come them. in and challenge the vocalization and it was incredible it was incredible to see them react just like you know it was a turkey you were hunting a turkey that looked like a peacock but you know it was just it was exceptional and day one just you know just all just little things started adding up just little things like I went to the first hunt the first morning. We went and sat on a place where we thought we heard a turkey roosted. And we sat there. We waited for it to come light. As we turned around to walk out of the jungle, I noticed another hunter sitting in the chair. And I was like, wow, where did he come from? And so I walk up to him. I said, did you get one? And he's thumbs up and he shows me the bird. And it's an exceptional bird. I've obviously never seen one before in my life. Yeah. And I said, where'd you kill it? Where'd you, where'd you get that turkey? He was like, oh, literally just where you've been standing for the last hour and a half. Uh. So it was, it, there was a lot of those types of things, but it was a lot on me. And so to me, I walked into this experience with this pressure on me to say, I'm going to get this done. I'm going to kill this world slam. 
and I was thinking about the I was thinking about the trophy picture, like you explained, the, the pictures that I was going to put on Twitter, the pictures I was going to put on Instagram. What are my friends going to think on Facebook? Yeah. And it just started eating into me. And the first turkey that I missed, we challenged it. It came in, did all the rookie moves that I know I shouldn't do and shouldn't make. The, the guides down there put a little bit of pressure on you. You know, when they see that turkey, they're telling you, shoot, 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 shoot over your shoulder. That's something that if you haven't gone down there, that's something you're prepped for because it, it sort of rattles you, right? It's like you've now got all this mounted pressure. It's like you're in a big grandstand stadium with people behind you saying, shoot, 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 shoot the turkey. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, you tend to, like I did, you tend to pull the trigger a little bit. And I, that first miss, I, I claimed victim a good two and a half to three inch limb. And I, I, Bent that limb right over 90 degrees. It was a beautiful shot. Oh, yeah. Centered it. Um, centered it. it yeah. I couldn't have hit that tree any better. And, you know, then I had another chance. Missed again. And by that second miss, now something is inside you, right? Now yeah. you're like... Can I shake this? Can I get back on the horse? And the, and the guys that I'm with are, you know, they're trying to be encouraging to me. And here's, here's the key. Here's the key to the whole thing. I could have taken a, a attitude of resentment. I could have taken an attitude of absolute anger and frustration. And obviously I was. I was frustrated internally. But look at where I was. I was in the middle of the Yucatan jungle, 80 miles from the Guatemalan line. With, with friends and around me and I'm, I'm learning. I'm really just digging myself into an environment that I've, I have to learn from. Yeah. And I have to exhibit a positive attitude. You know, I have to, I have to take this in my stride. I've got to say, what is, what am I, what is, you know, what's the Lord trying to teach me here? What am I, what am I, what am I here for? And you, you start obviously questioning self. You start questioning yourself as a hunter. Everybody's been there, right? Oh, yeah. Everybody's like, am I even supposed to be a hunter? When you, you, when you're missing successive, successive opportunities. And, and, and I think that that was, the, you know, I had, there was somebody, one of the guys that went down there with killed his, um, his world slam. It was his first time killing his, finishing his world slam. And he told me he got out the vehicle when he had done it and he was just absolutely so worked up, G'd up in terms of how this was it. This is what he's been working for for years. Yeah. And he was worried about hooping and hollering because of the way that I was, the situation I was in. And he said to me, he said, Robbie, you could have, you know, I was worried, but you were the first one to leave the tent and come and congratulate me. Yeah. And, and that's the attitude you have to take. And that was something that I think that, you know, I'm going to take into many hunts in the future. And I think that everybody in that camp is going to be in that situation again. I'm going to be in that situation again. And you can look back at that experience and go, wow, that's that's probably the attitude I need to take instead of just being mopey and sad and really just, you know, the world is against me kind of scenario. Right. Yeah. So the the final miss was was classic. The final miss was and I'll walk you through and I'm going to give you just a tidbit of the three hours of that last hunt. But I, when I say that this is uh, this is what the week looked like in terms of the little bits and pieces that I was I was talking about it, it, it is it's a perfect encapsulation of the week. OK, this concludes the free portion of this week's show. If you would like to listen to the full episode this week as well as the full episode from every week in the past, and the full episode for every week for the next 52 weeks, then all you have to do is subscribe to the show. Subscribing is easy, and it is very cheap. The cost of subscribing is $12, basically a dollar a month. And I'm going to donate $1 from every subscription to the NWTF to give back to the people who work so hard to make sure that we have turkeys to enjoy watching and hunting as well. So to subscribe, all you need to do is text the word turkey hunter, one word, turkey hunter, to the number 44222. What will happen from there is I will send you a text back that asks you to reply to that text only with your email address. Once you reply with your email address, I will then email you a link that you can click on to walk through the subscription process. So you'll basically create your username and your password, and you'll pay for the subscription right there. Then from that point, 
You can enter your username and password into the Podbean application on your mobile device, and you can listen to the show on the go. It really is easy to subscribe, and you're going to get about twice as much content every week. So now that you know how to subscribe, I want to say that Robbie's not the only person who's gone on a trip like this with the expectation of putting a tag on the leg of a turkey. I know this to be true because I have had those same expectations on many of the trips that I've been on, especially the guided or semi-guided trips on private property. I am 100% sure that many of you guys listening have had the same expectations of filling tags, even if those tags are issued by your home state and in the past have been filled by simply walking out of your back door and into the woods. But just like Robbie shared, it doesn't always happen that way. I have even shared the disappointment of my Alabama spring season with you guys, and I'm very well aware that our expectations and goals in the woods may go unfilled. The well-known quote that life is a journey, not a destination, has been spun a hundred different ways. But I kind of like my dad's take on that whole philosophy. My dad has traveled all over the world hunting all kinds of different critters. And he always says that half of the fun of those trips was the getting there. Now, what he's implied and what he's left off of that is that the other half of the fun of those trips is the people you meet, the experiences you have once you get there, and the memories that you make while you're there as well. So, for those of you who ended your hunting season still needing your first turkey, For those of you who still need that last one to complete your Grand Slam, your Royal Slam, your World Slam, or your Super Slam, and for those of us who may have had a tough season because of weather, lack of birds, lack of access, or just plain old lack of time, sit back and reflect on the small successes, the funny stories, the time shared in woods with those that you love, or the new friends that you made. Don't ever forget that those are the reasons that we hunt. Don't ever forget that the word hunt is what we do. It's what we enjoy. It's what we live for. And it is what creates that fire in us to get back out into God's great outdoors. If we knew we were going to kill every time that we went in the woods, then those of you who turkey hunt in a state where you're allowed one tag in a season... Well, you would only get to go out and enjoy the spring and the outdoors one day chasing turkeys because that would be the day you killed. I just don't think there's a whole lot of fun in that. Okay, so with all that said, next turkey season starts today. Start planning and preparing to make more memories and friends and have more amazing experiences in the woods next season. I want you guys to get your mind, your body, your gear, and your hunting properties in shape for next season. Cameron and I are going to be helping you guys with all that all summer long, and we will continue that process next week where I'll be sharing an awesome turkey hunting book with you guys. So you'll want to be sure to tune in for next week's show. In the meantime, we have an important holiday coming up next week, and I personally From the bottom of my heart, with all sincerity, want to thank not only all those soldiers and their families who paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we can still enjoy our freedoms today, but I also want to thank those of you who served and are serving our country and the armed forces and made so many other sacrifices to help keep those of us at home safe. My hat is off to all of you. May God bless you and your families and keep you safe in this crazy world we live in. All right. On that note, I have one and only one favor to ask you guys this week. Tell a soldier thank you. And not just a handshake and a thank you, but go a little bit above and beyond that. Buy him or her a cold beer. Buy him a warm lunch or breakfast. Pay for his or her movie ticket this weekend. Wherever you happen to be this weekend, if you see a soldier, do a little something for them. They have done and are doing a lot of something for us. So a thank you is okay. 
but a thank you and a little bit of something extra that will take your thank you to the next level with that soldier. So that is my one favor that I ask of you guys this week. And that's all that I've got for you. Thank you guys so much for tuning in this week. I know that you have choices. I appreciate you spending your time with us. I hope you have a wonderful week, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Goodbye. Thanks for tuning in. You were just listening to the Turkey Hunter podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please go on over to iTunes and leave a five-star review. And make sure to head over to www.iamturkeyhunting.com to subscribe for free turkey hunting tips, tactics, strategies, and product reviews to help you have a more successful turkey season. And stay tuned for upcoming episodes on hunting afternoon birds, how to film your hunt, and the breeding cycle of hens, as well as some guest interviews. Thanks again for listening. We know your time is valuable, and we appreciate you sharing some of it with us. See you next week.